When you first turn on a video game console, what do you think of? The fancy splash screen, the iconic startup sound, the memories of a simpler time when you sat way too close to a TV ready to play a game for the whole weekend and nothing but? That's cool, but I think of the console's user interface. Dick, that's kind of boring, isn't it? Well, yeah, but these things are the real soul of these consoles. The outcome of making rocks actually think to some extent? I could wax philosophic for hours on what the soul of a machine is, but my co-writer is giving me the side eye, so let's move on. I'm gonna wax you if you use another $30 phrase like wax philosophic again, I swear to god. When you first turn on most recent consoles, they have an internal, let's just call it memory for simplicity. It takes you to a screen with a bunch of options. Play a game, go online, open corn hub, etc. Before those consoles became the all-in-one entertainment system, they would just go into whatever game you had inserted. And before that, they did nothing. Like, pretty much nothing. You got a black screen. That middle area though, the one I mentioned before, we got something there. Now, let's be clear, some of these are like part of the BIOS, or I'm not gonna get that detailed, essentially part of the system where they make sure that everything is working on a basic level and so that you're not pirating a game. That part doesn't interest me. What does interest me is the additional functionality that a console can do without a game inserted. This can be a ton of things, and more and more was added over the years as consoles became more like computers and developed into the all-in-one entertainment. I'm gonna consider it as part of the firmware, but I know someone is going to point out how this is probably wrong, or an oversimplification, or how I'm just the worst person on the internet that they've ever seen. Alright, let me also define the word console, cause I don't want anyone talking about how they're the Commodore Amiga's strongest soldier. That shit is a fucking computer. Bitch came with a keyboard, and a mouse most of the time. I'm not focusing on a console unless there's something specific that caught my attention. Same with any aftermarket editions, no EverDrives that are modded in, or newly flashed BIOSes like Neo Geo's UniBIOS. The double dip consoles don't count either. We have enough to talk about with the real console that we don't need to talk about a fucking SNES Mini or a Genesis Mini or your little co-worker's desktop Galaga game. I also want to be clear. The ones that have apps, like the more recent consoles, uh, we aren't looking at apps. The shops count as apps. If I have to keep things connected to the internet to see it, it's automatically not going to be part of this discussion. Also, I can't begin to tell you how much of a pain in the ass it is to find the system boots for these older slash unpopular consoles. These things are just not the focus for most people. Some aren't here because it's either hard to find or impossible to emulate, or who knows, maybe there's some other third option that you can point at from a Wikipedia article that I missed. Good job. I know I'm gonna miss a bunch of them, and I'm certain you have a friend who could have done this video better, so you know what, good for them. The first consoles don't really have much we can talk about since cartridges weren't really common. There wasn't really any way to read data that's not already soldered to a motherboard. The video game industry wouldn't really come about for a while since the sheer idea of having something on a TV screen being controlled by you in real time was practically witchcraft. Also, most of them just played Pong, like dedicated Pong machines, or TV tennis, which is just copyright free Pong. It's not until the second generation do we really get what we traditionally think of as a video game console. But even then, we mostly run into the same issue, since most don't work without a game plugged in. The Fairchild Channel F is probably the first one people remember, thanks to that gaming historian video. It's a great video and I highly recommend it, but covered in passing was the fact that the console had two games built into the system memory. Hockey looks cool, because they programmed all the walls and the diagonals for the paddles. Tennis is just Pong, sorry, TV tennis because Pong is a copyrighted brand. Still, it's something impressive for people who might have not realized that this one can play other games and just bought it wholesale. Intellivision had something going on with this play cable thing, but it's really more like SegaNet or a proto-internet capable console, so it's not gonna get counted here, but worth a mention that online gaming was a thing since this early. The Vectrix was another unpopular console from this time, but had a built-in game available called Mindstorm. 
Again, not a UI, but an honorable mention. In the third generation, there was something called an Atari XEGX, or the Atari XE Game System. I have no fucking clue what an XE means, but whatever. All right, what is this thing? This is a fucking computer. Computers don't count. Well, I'm gonna have to say next. Okay, we're actually at the start of things now. So UIs became more common in consoles when they became powerful pieces of hardware. A lot of that was due to a shift in cartridges no longer making up for the handicaps of a system. So the software needed to take more advantage of the limits of the hardware. No Super FX chip is going to save your game from running like ass, but that also meant that games got more consistent in pricing. Eventually CDs became the new hotness, the consoles got smarter, especially since now there were multiple ways to leverage both, and this led to new questions. Why not let the console play music and video games? Or how will you manage the data for these games being saved? Most CD readers don't have write capability and definitely couldn't erase, so how are you going to make that easy? That's what the first UIs were for. Big shocker. SHOCKER! With the advent of CDs, Sega and Philips were really the first ones to jump on that wagon. Is that too old of a saying? Uh, either way, it's kind of wild that Nintendo hated the CD so much that they just didn't want to deal with it until the GameCube, but we'll get there. Dude, looking at the Philips CDI, it is... it's adorable, man. Philips had an idea of what they wanted to do. You can very clearly tell that they wanted to have something very professional looking. This isn't your little Billy's game console. Instead, this is a fucking entertainment system. Something that handles compact discs, interactive media. This is the real deal when it comes to Philips, man. And it feels so business-like, so corporate for something that was inevitably a controller that looked like shit. <laughs> All of this looks really ugly, it's really horrible. I do love the tiling CDs in the background, that's kind of hilarious. Really trying to sell you on the idea that, hey, did you know that we had to pay licenses to use compact disc in our media? I also kind of love the color scheme of everything. It's got this very like American Super Nintendo look with the purple and all gray. A little bit of green and like, I guess that's kind of like a rose color on like the more button down there. It's not terrible. It does what it needs to do, but and you ain't winning any awards any time for design. I have in my notes here that the Sega CD is the first real CD player in American and European homes, but I feel like that's kind of some bullshit. I don't know anybody that really grew up with a Sega CD, and I really didn't remember anybody who came back later and was like, oh yeah, the Sega CD. I'm gonna listen to my musical compact disc on this. But you know what? That's for another time. I will admit though, I do love the classiness of the Sega CD kind of splash screen, but at the same time, there's not a lot you can really do in the menus. It does have a built-in CD player, and some of the different types are absolutely fantastic. I'm looking at a car from the 80s that just got a built-in CD player for like the first time and it's got an all digital screen. Still has kind of like those old hardware buttons that, you know, vehicles used to have all over the place. And you were kind of wondering like, what the fuck is pitch? Space? Intro? Program? What the fuck is this? And you're just kind of like, flabbergasted and want to press the buttons but your dad or your mom tells you like don't fucking touch the dash all of this shit looks cool though i love the aesthetic i love the vibe all of it looks just really cool i'll be honest i don't have a lot to really say about the neo geo cd it gets an honorable mention for kind of looking like an 8-track stereo setup gotta love my old vaporwave ass aesthetics here otherwise there's not really much of a ui to speak of either way again we disregarded the uni bios and all the other things that kind of get added on down the line so i'm not really in a mood to really go into that either way i'm getting the vibes of kind of like sitting in my mom's 93 pontiac looking at this even more so than the sega cd bro the ps1 startup sound sounds like what it feels like for 90s dudes to come real talk this shit goes so fucking hard. 
I love this dumbass sound effect. I don't know how they made it, but I'm pretty sure somebody else has some of the YouTube video on how to make that. Otherwise, I'm just kind of like looking through all of the weird designs that they've kind of had. Uh, I guess I should actually kind of go over what a lot of these things have or brought to the table. PS1 had a CD player and a memory card manager, but essentially most of the ones that I've covered so far have pretty much just that. CD player, memory card, or system storage manager. If you're wondering like, oh, well, why are you, are you gonna go back and cover those? Uh, no, I'm not going back now. I'm recording this in order and completely with a half script and it looks like shit. Looking at the original though, I can't hate the minimalism of it. Like we have just the most bare minimum of a UI. It's all squares. It's all perfectly evenly cut out like cement tiling. Like I'm looking at somebody's like ungrouted walls in their fucking bathroom. But I do love that this is one of the first times that you really get to see saves managed or specifically represented by the icon of the game. Like you can kind of just take, what the fuck is that like little racist black man? Please hover that one. Oh my God, no, I need, I need to see you hover that one. What is the little racist black man? What is the, what is the racist? South Park. <laughs> Either way, I do love that the memory card manager is actually represented by actual save slots by image of each one of the games and in most cases you can easily identify it except for you know that horribly racist little black man that I had to sit there and just stop over. It's a really intuitive way of just being able to tell what games are on a memory card at a glance and I don't need to read every fucking line of it or scan through a long overly done menu. It's super useful and I love the grid layout. The CD player has a bunch of features, a lot of things that you would see in you know kind of a DJ setup which I actually think is fairly impressive. Things for like dome hall and church effects or even like a studio so there's obviously some type of re reverb that is able to add to the music as it's playing in the CD. Oh man, the Sega Saturn. Yeah, no, I didn't have one of these. I was team Sony pony by this time, but man, do I just love this UI screen. I love that it tells you at the beginning, like, hey, is your disk drive open or is something else wrong? But mainly I just kind of love the look of it. You can hide the controls and just have like this little fucking rocket just fly around on the screen as he transitions into this really kind of pretty looking, just kind of space effect. And as soon as you press the button, all of it comes right back. The actual like real love of this is the CD player menu. I love how all of this looks and even having like the advanced controls come out, have everything really kind of just be beautifully animated and transitioning in and out. You really feel like you're playing with something that's really kind of advanced for its time. Too bad Sega really thought like quads was going to beat triangles. Yeah, that one didn't work out so well. Ultimately, loving this fucking space theme. Loving the vibes, loving the little rocket. All of that shit's so fucking cool. Hell, I'm apparently not the only person who thought it was the sickest shit, because somebody actually remade it in Dreams. Ah, oh, man, Dreams, we never deserved you. So sad that you're gone. Okay, what's this next thing? Apple made a video game console? Wow, okay. What's this thing look? This is just a computer. No, dude. No, oh, no. I told you, we're not dealing with computers, let alone a fucking Mac. Which, I mean, it's not bad for being a Mac, but we're not dealing with computers. Shout out to Apple, though, for thinking that gaming was eventually just going to be the PC market. Because guess what? They're kind of right. No, I don't respect the mobile game market. Oh, man. Here we go. The fucking 3DO. Where are we, man? How did we get here? What is this granite like SpongeBob's about to sculpt me out of the fucking marble? And then there's bouncing CDs, CD graphic, compact disc, digital audio, the 3DO logo. Who is that other company there? What is this? I'm really in the wrong neighborhood and I'm getting a little scared, dude. This whole thing is perfectly 90s and this solitaire win animation at the start is kind of fun, but I'm gonna be real. I used to confuse this with the fucking CDI all the time. Looking at the actual menu interfaces, again, it's a little bit cleaner than what I want to call the CDI is. At least it has like a little bit of personality by implying depth. Ultimately not horrible, but it gets the job done. The PC effects is something I'm gonna have to like capture again through an emulator because again, I don't know anybody who was dank enough to import one of these things from Japan. Looking at the UI, it's very cutesy. 
I can even tell, even with the language barrier of what each one of the buttons are supposed to be. Play music, look at pictures, play a game, or I'm guessing this little photocopier is the system management, which I kind of like. Uh, I can't read any of the system menus though, but the very minimalist green and gray, again, reminds me a lot of an office computer. It's ultimately very utilitarian, but still very cute and colorful in areas that it needs to be. By this point, everyone was on board on how consoles needed disk drives, especially since everyone realized, hey, no one gives a shit about your console unless devs are making games for it that are sick. Sega must have heard me, cause uh, 26 years ago, God, they made this UI slap. The bounciness of the UI icons are strong, they're obviously using the same unshaded texture and colors that the early PS1 games were using, but with their approach it adds a ton of charm. A pleasant dream approach, if you will. Insert joke about Stein's aesthetic. I remember a lot of the sounds on this thing being kinda harsh, but I realize now that was mostly from all of my past experiences with the console being through emulators. And while this footage is from an emulator 2, unnamed cause I expect you to know how to use a search engine, the sounds seem to be more in line with real hardware and aren't actively trying to kill me. I think I also forgot that this was on shelves next to the PS2 and the PS1, which makes sense since the graphics kind of feel like that middle ground. Way cooler than your old PlayStation 1, but nowhere near as futuristic or performant as the PS2 and friends. The vibes I get from this thing is that it was more of a family-friendly console. You know, a kid's toy for the most part, but could still play the big boy mommy milker games. Honestly, I kinda wish more consoles would come back to this level where things were simple, but I think that might be nostalgia talking. I didn't even own a Dreamcast physically. Holy Fuck trying to find footage of someone just looking at the menu through a capture card, commentary or not, was such a pain in the ass. There's so many GameCube corruption videos on YouTube, it actually has me feeling sad for any of them, hoping to be the next I'm surprised the GameCube isn't used more in the horror sphere, cause the idea of a glass cube listlessly floating in the void like that one Pokemon that steals children is creepy as hell, B. I know there's more than one, trust me. I do like the other half of the UI when you enter a menu though. Creating text from like this drone swarm of cubes is kinda cool, but it just makes me think of Big Hero 6, which is not easy cause who the fuck remembers Big Hero 6? The sound effects aren't anything that stand out to me, minus the switching from each face of the cube. That part lives in my head rent free just because of how strange it sounds. Ultimately, I gotta put on my pretentious art hat and call out that the vibes of being transparent are there. Like, there's nothing hidden. You can see everything for what it's worth, but more so that it's just the cube. The nozzle. Please do not look away from the nozzle. Hey yo, the startup sound goes hard. Like, the rest of the UI is also great. Very angelic and sci-fi, like Makoto Kusanagi hears this shit when she gets on the net, especially when the screen lights up when opening the settings menu. It's so strong, kinda like lifting the veil on this strange new technology. The memory card manager and disk menu screen is clean, but kinda boring. Uh, kinda like the UI you would see in like a David Cage game. But what saves it for me is the absolute charm in memory card management. Like, why did we stop doing this? This is so cool. Like, look at this little guy piss himself when he thinks you're gonna delete him. I'll never kill you, people, monkey. I'd kill for you. Let me complain a bit about finding videos for this also before I gave up and just decided to capture it myself. I feel like piracy takes over most of the discussion around this area, specifically the kind of shit that's gonna get you a fucking virus from downloading a media fire. Ultimately though, crazy strong vibes on the PS2, and that's without the nostalgia talking. If the previous two are ideals of the future in the sense of keeping things simple and clean 2002 remix, then the Xbox is the most Toonami, BattleBots, Gundam, Big Hey, big ass green mountain do the do design I can't help but love. It's iconic, down to the main color scheme, just as much as the others. I remember walking into GameStop and just by looking at the main colors of the walls, you could tell what consoles the games were for. Mountain Dew Voltage for the PS2, Code Red for Nintendo, 
an original for Xbox. I also remember the idle sounds on the menu used to fuck me up because I would fall asleep with the TV on and up way too loud. There's like a robot talking and having other conversations going on, but like I have no idea what it's about. I also talked a lot about the mech vibes earlier, but yeah, I love it. It's so cool and mechanical. The way the menu folds in and out of each other, same with having that zoom in, zoom out with the options. The vibes are just the coolest Hawken, Titanfall, fuck off Apex vibes with Toonami game fuel going in. Dude, I'm not even the only one who's a fan of this. Everyone loved the aesthetics of this era. I mean, look at this guy. Look at him go. Can't wait to look at the future of gaming web comics. Speaking of the future, Welcome to the future. Video games are now secondary on console. As we enter the era where GameStop starts to piss itself over NFTs and Funko Pops, and the legend of the indie is the last hope big enough to remind gamers that maybe a game shouldn't always cost a million dollars to make. This timeline has been viewed as both a good and bad move in hindsight, mainly because I wouldn't have this video topic otherwise. But since we don't need games to make the consoles do things, they're now just low-spec computers that come up short to the real thing, leading to devs making programs special just for them. Again, good and bad move. Alright, we're starting off with the best. I'm going to call out my own bias early that this was 100% my favorite of this era. The Blades feel like the first of the OS's that really found the best balance of having to deal with ad space because, hey, it was 2005, that space was going to be required somewhere, and utilizing that to actually have the user find things that they want to do. I'm unfortunately going to have to start calling this out going forward. Because of the advent of the internet, it's a new opportunity to sell you some shit. I also have to call out another thing. Since the ads aren't just built into the console, most consoles will try to grab as many of them all at once and keep going from there. The majority of the Blades UI is focused on getting you where you want to go in the menu and loading quick. They were built and designed with speed in mind, each blade being a grouping of what you might want to get to and the quick menu, uh, that's what I'm going to call the pop-up when you hit the big button on the 360 controller, just gets you right to it no matter the game, usually in about three or so presses. It was also a good balance between showing off the new thing Xbox wanted to give you, while being limited to just a few tabs and letting you navigate the menus. The ads never showed up in the quick menu, so it was always near instant, and the ads also tended to stay relevant to each blade. Unfortunately, some exec at Microsoft noticed all the piles of advertising money not being bigger than they can conceive, so a change was in order. Three years later, the 360 is getting fairly mature. Apparently some people have been asking for new features, but some dumbass focus tester says that they want something new, a new experience, if you will. I'm saying it like that since I don't know anybody back then complaining about the UI. So it's time to shake things up. People really love the Wii, right? Well, we can get something just like that. Say hello to the Xbox avatars. They have less personality, more detail, and you can even see what the underside of their shoe looks like. Well, bam There it is. I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but that's okay. The new Xbox experience, or NXE, was here to give your Xbox personality. And by that, I mean it was here to get you to buy a bunch of dumb shit for a character model that was hardly used in anything. With that, the ads just started coming in stronger. These tiles, as I've seen them called, now would have about one to three of them per row just advertising shit, and it slowed things down. Way down. But that's okay, because things were going to get slow anyway. Why? Well, even though it was a few years early, it's speculated, fun word since it gets me out of research, that the Kinect was confirmed to be in active development when this UI update came out. Having the UI out first a couple of years early to force people to get used to it was also a genius bully tactic by Microsoft, since you couldn't get future updates for most things without updating the UI. And then the Kinect finally dropped. I don't need to tell you that your body being the controller was fucking terrible. Everyone knows and agrees that it was Microsoft grasping at all the money Nintendo made like a, a fucking cheap whore. Yeah. The UI reflected the terrible change by making a few more final tweaks to give this half-baked idea some legs. Since the tech was so bad at reading people's body parts, the UI had to make a bunch of concessions, namely making it so large movements 
were required to go around from screen to screen. This sucked, since pressing a button has things like feedback, speed, ease of use, can be made accessible to be used by just about anyone, including those needing consolidations. I can go on. And because of the changes and not wanting to waste space of the very limited resources, uh, the 360 had about half a gig of fairly slow RAM. Everyone had to use this new UI and there was no going back. Fortunately, if you didn't want to use the Kinect's motion controls, you can use the built-in spy mic. I mean, data collect, I mean, the room quality microphone that was on all the time to navigate quickly. That's where the Xbox turn off memes came from. Where's Xbox shut off? Xbox shut off? No, 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 no. So after a few years and the undeniable failure of the Kinect, Microsoft got sick of the complaints about the UI again, but what should it be like now? Well, in the background, Microsoft was putting out developer previews on their next iteration of Windows, specifically Windows 8, since it was coming out the next year. Let's just give Xbox gamers a similar experience to the Windows desktop. This was seen as a bad idea, primarily since some might not remember Win 8 was a very mobile slash tablet friendly design. This means large square everywhere, minimalist font on everything, biggest square gets to be advert, right in the middle, pay for your favorite app and streaming services, you can see them from across the room now, dick don't blow out the microphone on this part, please I fucking- can you tell I don't like it? No one else really did either. Windows 8 sucked so bad that they had to make Windows 8.1, which Microsoft hasn't had to do since like the 90. It was essentially an apology in so many squares, but there were things that some people did like, like having quick access to just Netflix or whatever the fuck was on the homepage right when they booted things up. You see, some people weren't just buying consoles to play video games now. You can now call up a baddie and just watch shit on it. And Microsoft was aware of this, because the app developers were very aware of this. So that part it needed to stick. Thus, the UI got another small touch up. It's hard to remember in retrospect as a user, so I'm glad someone else documented all this. Some of the fonts are bolded like along the top, the background is a little bit darker, the squares are even larger and take up more of the dead space like you got told to sit at the front of the fucking class. The designs though are still relatively touch OS like to me, which I've had to begrudgingly accept and got used to ever since 8, 8.1, and 10. The overall speed, by the way, has only gotten slower and slower. Not just to navigate, but to just load. The 360 couldn't just download more RAM even in the later revisions since Xbox cares about console parity. They weren't going to have the half console upgrade that genuinely changed how the games are played like Sony or Nintendo does, except when they kinda did. But this meant that the UI kept getting more bloated and slow, making the ability to actually play games on it more difficult for the little Ecto Cooler juice box. It was essentially never meant to be this way. The Xbox became a multimedia system instead of a games console, and the next Xbox would double down on that super hard. But it just feels terrible that Uncle Bill made the little 360 do all this and more, only for the younger brother to take it all away from him and be left without nothing but a red ring for the troubles. I'm sorry for going so in depth on all of this, but none of the other consoles went through this major of a revamp every few years. All right, well, what's Sony doing? Oh, this bitch is telling you it's $600 of fancy with this fucking orchestra warming up their instruments. Look, I was riding Microsoft's micropeen a little bit back there, but I can't ignore Sony with the cross media bar. This thing is literally genius and apparently designed by a single man, Yasuhiro Yamanaka. At least that's what his LinkedIn says and it's the common belief. And I gotta say, it's perfect. Taking the tree category system used in about every directory known to man since the 70s and just using the axis to represent the second layer, it's simplicity by design. And Sony knew it too. It never got changed or updated. The sounds are distinct but reflect this positive slash forward selection, the negative cancels, the notification system, everything in a very quiet percussion string-like design with a background that looks like satin blowing in the wind. Have you seen the PS3? That shit is nice, nice, slick, black. That sounds fucking gay. <laughs> Hell, it was so good that the handheld copied it one for one. Look, what am I supposed to say about the PSP? 
Second verse, same as the first, except you it's not. You, you can play outside. outside. I do gotta suck the PSP's peep real quick too, cause this thing, oh, it fucks so hard. Love playing games on it, watching movies. Hell, I used to read comics on this thing. You guys remember the comics app on this? I had that shit running after I hacked it. Look, Sony was on some shit with the UMDs and their proprietary memory sticks, so you better believe I'm joining the war on piracy on the side of the pirates. Eventually, Sony cut that shit out, though. The Wii's wall of screens is pulling some kind of Neo in the Matrix 3 shit that I can't really take seriously. Ultimately, they capture what Xbox and eventually Sony would do by having a line of colorful squares of apps represent what the user wants to do. It's a design so simple and easy that I can't knock. Hell, even Strawbear can use it. The all-white design still burns into the back of my retinas, though, every time I have to look at it. With all the screens everywhere, the whole vibe feels a little bit clinical. Like that movie with Christian Bale doing gun katas. Why did every movie look like this for a fucking decade, dude? The sounds are something still I have to give to Nintendo. Instantly iconic, even if you haven't used this system in years. I want to say this was the first real console to push the percussions to represent button confirmations even. Even then, Nintendo made it their own, since it adds a lot to the identity on how each console was treated over the years. I can't really say that for... Alright. You got me now! I never owned a Wii U. I never even used a Wii U. I had Simu back in the day when the Wii U had games that the Switch didn't, but now I own those games on the Switch, so go ahead, tell the Nintendo police. I have the, have receipt. the receipts. Even then, I wasn't your average grandpa. I could tell it was a different console, it was just a console I didn't want. The Wii 2 didn't have anything to entice, and the UI kinda shows how it was really just the Wii 1.5. I do like the heavier focus on the Miis. These little guys were really only used in first party Nintendo games and specifically party games. So having them take center stage is a welcome change in my eyes. Also having the Wii-verse be the big defining feature I feel was something worth putting front and center, but not a real reason to buy the console. It really made the Wii U feel more like the online console compared to the Wii's I'm just kinda happy to be here offline style. And overall, the Wii U sold that sense of community. I know it was so good of an idea that Splatoon is essentially known and remembered so fondly for this feature as well. That, and you know, kids with not guns. The children crave violence after all. I think another double-edged sword has to be the Wii U trying to play everything that the Wii did, and also still using Wiimotes. Like, you can just pull up the Wii menu in this thing, which I think even also had GameCube compatibility too. This is awesome from a game preservation and support standpoint, but it's also the fucking Wii U. I got nothing on the DS. It was very minimal. There was no music. Sounds are nice, except for like the download play noise. It's very business and office-like. That is my notes on the DS. The DSi at least had a little bit going for itself in terms of a UI. This really does feel like a step before the 3DS, but the hardware just didn't justify a new console yet. You know, since all consoles after the GBA and GameCube era had to have a gimmick. Ultimately, it's all very clean, readable, somewhat clinical, like someone just listed off requirements for a menu and were ultimately just directed to make mock-ups and had that as the finalized thing. Which isn't bad, it's not like kids were spending a ton of time in the menus or have anything that would keep them there like a hot beat. Ooh, this shit got some heat though. This got me want to take my girl dancing. All right, other than the internet settings, the 3DS is a proper implementation of what the DSi was going for. Colorful, rounded edges on things, each screen has like an actual color scheme, the icons are super identifiable, actual theme support, which I know previous consoles we've talked about have had to some extent, but this was Nintendo, who don't do shit. Even they had to wake up and show some love. Every game and app also had their own little jingles and custom 3D rotating models which was just peak. And as for DS games, you got a little model cartridge with the game's logo and it played the old DS jingle. It's really charming. Hello little stylus. Hello Mario. 
From the pure UI standpoint, in terms of looks and usability, it's the first one from Nintendo that I actually love. It's funny, because this is the one console I owned for the shortest amount of time. I literally bought the Paper Mario Color Splash one to play A Link Between Worlds and Smash 3DS in college. And I hated Paper Mario Color Splash. And I hated Smash for 3DS. Link Between Worlds I will bump gladly any day of the week though, that shit's cool. I ended up giving away the 3DS after a few months for a friend to hack it. Did you know? It's actually incredibly easy to mod your 3DS. Just type in Cornhub into your internet browser and it's f***ing Mario Kart again! I have the end gauge written in the script here. Uh, it was a cell phone that played games around this same era in time. I want to say cell phones don't count, but did you know the rumor about the design for the N-Gage being modeled after Go- I'm still mad about the Vita. Not the UI, just the console in general after being a PSP fan. So the Vita wanted this bubble design to represent every game and app. You could only have like, I think 10 of them on any given screen. And it wasn't until a later update that you could make folders or groups of them. It wastes a ton of space for a console that's a handheld only touch mode system with tiny buttons. Yes, I am aware that there was a later update to actually use buttons to navigate the menus. It was an update though, it wasn't day one. Opening one of the apps would take a long while because it had to grab all the assets, links, or whatever was inside depending on the limited memory of the thing. The menus were also bloated like a beached whale to account for fat fingers when I'd rather just use the buttons from the start. They also would have to load and unload a lot and would easily hang. Since the device had like basic Wi-Fi support and 5G, it somehow felt slower than the PSP or the internet was just more bloated in general around that time. The pages for each app could be specialized by each developer before you actually get into the game, so I'll consider them as part of the UI too. Too bad that this could make the app take upwards of 10 seconds just to open and then you could get stuck watching the bubble button just kind of fucking rotate around in place. Instead, this whole thing was made for a front touchscreen. Why'd you say it like that, Nicholas? Oh, did you not remember? This stupid thing had a back touchpad too. They didn't give us extra shoulder buttons because this was gonna do that job, remember? They'd eventually take that concept and make it default for the PS4 and 5's touchpad, which is also a whatever idea people just kind of went along with. Buttons and physical design aside, it's horrible. This is like the PSP's half-cousin that got held back a year due to homeschooling. I know the Switch doesn't particularly belong here, but they got their own dog booty ass ads every time you turn it on, so I'm calling it out here in the advertiser section. Minimalism has killed creativity. Cause what the fuck is this? Even the 3DS had the option for multiple rows of icons. How did you take so many steps back, Nintendo? Since the developer sets the icons too, there's no quality control on these. It's just whatever they want, and it could be ugly or not in line with everything else on the system, because there is no line. Everything around the main menu feels so empty and barren, like I feel the dark call of advertisers ready to just fill up all of this empty space on this thing. To be honest, all of this really feels like mock-ups that you would have in hand to like a developer. Like somebody just came up with the idea of a UI, using boring fonts, no colors other than eggshell white and gun in my mouth gray. Um, actually, Nicholas, it's not eggshell. Shut up! It's a shitload of fuck and avalanche of diarrhea. Put in themes already, you goddamn. Now you're playing with fucking shit. You're better off fucking shit than fucking with this fucked up shit. Fuck this shit. You don't know shit about how fucking shitty this fucking shit is. Why are these together in the same spot? Oh, well, we're mashing both of these together from a UI perspective. And uh, more importantly, I really just don't care anymore. Honestly, it looks like what the 360 was essentially evolving into anyway. Xbox, you can't submit the same assignment three times and expect to get anything but the same rating across all of them. I get the idea of new consoles are dying before our very eyes, but making all of them feel and look the exact same, yet they're just shitty, cheap computers, is not doing anything for me. 
At the end of the day, I do remember seeing a ton of big articles about, oh man, the UI is finally gonna get better, or fixed, or faster, but all of the updates just kind of blend together. I can't even find anything specific about calling them out as separate. So congrats, Xbox. Somehow, in the minimalism contest, you barely lost to Nintendo due to just reusing work from an earlier assignment. Alright, Sony, you gotta have something for me, dude. Please don't just make me out to be this horrible boomer that hates new things. Okay, I'm slightly boomer because I don't hate this, but why did we throw away the XMB? We had a good thing. I know I just got on Xbox's case about not changing anything, but you went the complete fucking opposite and got rid of everything. I see some remnant from the ashes around where the tree structure is still kind of used, but not really anymore. Instead, you leaned more into the folders and sticking ads with useless info on the bottom half of the screen. And while I can't call that wasted, it definitely used to be better for the user, instead of trying to get me to buy more shit. Instead, it kind of reminds me of the dumb switch menu with all the big squares at the top in a single row. Same with the smaller icons just above off screen, like why? The only thing I think I like about this one is the new UI sounds. Hearing them kind of makes me think of the PS2 and oh god, no, I really am liking something out of pure nostalgia. They're very cheery and happy, but ultimately something I like that can be changed with theming. Something Nintendo and Xbox have been terrible about doing in their recent outings. Okay, I know I made the second verse same as the first reference earlier, but man, this is blatant. Same dumb app focused single row design except for all the icons being smaller. So I'm getting less information somehow and more of the screen real estate is being used for these massive splash screens which I'm not gonna care about. And if there is anything to care about the cool art on the splash screens, they put a fucking ad or some stupid bullshit in front of it telling me to buy something. Sony, you gotta pick a side, dude. Either you're gonna throw ads in my face or you want this to be a nice wallpaper for my console. I'm chalking this inconsistency up to publishers being allowed to just do whatever the fuck they want, which tends to be nothing good if it doesn't get the user to buy something. They want you to think about the product, but only enough that you need to remember that there's something you want. No appreciation, only buy. This is starting to make me spiral into a fucking depression. Does this thing even do themes anymore? I don't know because I keep my personal console offline only because I want to play some games or like live stream them. I don't really want to deal with anything else. I also know I've been overlooking the apps first part of all these modern consoles now. Every one of the main three has some type of video app, social media integration, something that gets in the way of just playing video games. Which makes me question, why do I want to use my console for that? Do you guys, you guys just not have phones? Not have phones? Yeah, you guys not have phones. Phone. The reason I bought this eyesore that sits under my fucking TV now is so that I can play video games that I can't play on other consoles, and now that's slowly being pushed to the side so that I can watch The Office or whatever fuck-ass streaming service has the right to it now. On a console with no games, not worth the fucking asking price. Don't worry, this will be a future topic of its own. Soon. Alright everybody, now it's time for Dick's Picks! Uh, so I'm biased, uh, no surprise there, against the ad boxes. But I do want to make one thing clear, I don't hate advertising in general. What I do hate is what advertising has become, and how companies have gotten lazier about the idea. Watching shit no! like Vine Sauce's commercial no! chaos no, streams is proof easily. that I really don't no. think it's all that bad. It's just that how things now have to be pushed to everyone and constantly in your face, even if you don't care about it, and usually in the laziest ways possible. Look, I understand the business asshole is gonna say, Dave, the privacy is important, so to get around that, we just spent millions of dollars to show you an ad for something that either won't apply to you or you'll never buy anyway. I can be on this soapbox for a while, but let's move on. As for my actual picks, I really do love the early era when 3D was getting rendered into the UI, so the Dreamcast, PS2, Xbox are high tier. Why not the GameCube? Uh, well, I feel it's probably the most current year design that's 
kind of timeless, but it's also the most boring minimalist thing that I've ever seen. The pitch black background, colored cube setup feels ahead of its time, but it's not much of an identity if I can put on my pretentious hat for a second. The Dreamcast low poly bright and colorfulness is very appealing to me, especially when leveraging the VMUs being something that you can make your own is really genius. The PS2 has this glass futurism that I gotta check if it's on wallpaper engine because it's just so fucking clean. I gotta imagine this was like the backdrop on a TV in a doctor's office at one point in time. And the Xbox is so McClunky and retro future that it just makes me think of Ghost in the Shell hawking and a bunch of cool mech shit that we've lost as a collective over the years. The GOAT is the OG 360 for me, specifically the Blaze UI. It's probably hands down the first time I ever noticed and appreciated a console's UI without even knowing what the fuck UI stood for. Uh, it's short for user interface if you somehow forgot that by now, BT dubs. The design being completely recognizable by the color of the blade you're on, being able to do so much before any other the console was even trying to contemplate handling that many options for use as a real multimedia powerhouse while still being a gaming console first and foremost was really ahead of this time. The PS3 and PSP's XMB holds a close second in that era for me, but kind of falls into an overall fourth place behind the PS2 and Xbox. The sheer design simplicity along with the customization, which still feels undeniably the easiest to show to people who are not gamers on how to use it, is still just peak to me. And while it's not my favorite, it's so goddamn strong that I'd be doing a disservice for not filleting it for a little bit at the end. I feel like the more we look at these UIs and where they started and where they're going and all that, one trend has stayed consistent. A trend towards minimalist corporate UIs that just kind of get you to open Netflix faster. UIs started out pretty basic, hit a peak in terms of design in the middle, and now are just kind of on a shitty downward slope. Consoles like the Xbox, PS3, and 2, the Wii, the 3DS, they all kind of ooze their own vibe and creative flair, but future generations just seem to stop caring about it. And it really communicates to the gamer, aka us. With the glass ceiling broken, all the oppressed groups shall prosper, especially the most oppressed group of all, gamers. But they really just don't care that much about the creative aspect. And if you think they do... Well, um, I think I'm looking forward to crack... For real though, Nintendo, where are the fucking other themes for the Switch? It's been years.